12th, and it's a beautiful day here. It's good to be on with you this morning, and hope you had a good night's rest. I did. Um, had a good time last night. I was in the student ministry with the students last night, and um, just sharing with them, and I uh, just want to encourage us that we have a great next generation coming up, and I was encouraged by that last night. Um, just want to... Uh, Encourage you to share this this morning, if you will. Go ahead and hit that share button so that we can get the word out there and hopefully get people in the word. Uh, Want to um, let everybody know yesterday, as I was doing the daily devotion, we had a power outage here at the church. So I'm not sure exactly where everything dropped off. And so I'm going to pick up this morning on some of the points I was making regarding Abraham and when he took to sacrifice his son Isaac as the writer of Hebrews begins to explain to us in that. And so we can't avoid those power outages, but my apologies for yesterday. It was something that was out of our control. And oftentimes there are a lot of things in our life that aren't, aren't in our control. I always say one of, the, one of the greatest liberations in my life was to realize that there were certain things I had control over in my life, and that basically comes down to my response to situations and my initiation of actions. Uh, beyond that, most things are out of my and your control, and so uh, we trust God in those, and uh, that's kind of a liberating feeling to realize that most things are out of our control. It makes us put our trust and our faith in God, and rely on him. Well, this morning as I was meditating over this last point that I want to share uh, regarding why it is that to answer the question why would God call Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac? And of course it is a pre prefigure of, of Jesus and his sacrifice for us. And this song came to my mind and I just love this. It's a modern hymn uh, written last 10 or 15 years, but it's called How Deep the Father's Love for Us. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure that He should give His only Son to make a wretch's treasure. How great the pain of searing loss The Father turns His face away As wounds which were the chosen Bring many sons to Upon his shoulder, ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin. Until 
have paid my ransom. I'm going to sing that last stanza again. And the writer in the song asked the question, why should I gain? Why should I gain from, from his reward? But the writer has in mind there that as Christ was seated at the right hand of the Father after his resurrection and ascension, that his righteousness has been imputed to me and to you. And we have become heirs, joint heirs with Christ. All that the Father has given Christ, he has given us. And so the writer's asking, why should I gain when I didn't do anything? Jesus did it all for me. And so just contemplate that thought as <clears throat> I sing this last stanza again. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer. But this I know with have paid my ransom His wounds have paid my ransom The debt that we owed, the debt of sin, the wages of sin is death, the Bible says. We owed that as a consequence of our sins, but Jesus paid all of that debt for us and he paid the ransom. We were held captive by the enemy and in his grip, uh, and there was a ransom due. Um, we were kidnapped, held captive, but Jesus paid our ransom for us. Man, what a glorious thought. If that does not cause you to worship him, then, uh, man, I don't know, your spirit's dead. <laughs> He's paid our ransom, and we wanna worship him today, and, and it's him that we put our faith in and our trust. Well, here we're speaking of faith and the writer in Hebrews chapter 11. Again, yesterday we had a power outage, and so I'm not sure how much of this last point was uh, was picked up, but I think it's the most important point as we ask the question, why did God call Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac? And of course, we're making reference to Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 through 19. And I'll read that passage. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He, that is Abraham, considered that God was able to even raise him, that is Isaac, from the dead, from which figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. And so here the writer is making reference to that time when God had called Isaac to sacrifice his one and only son. And we were looking at the question yesterday, why is it that God would call Abraham to sacrifice his only son? Which we know that in the law and repeated in Jeremiah that, that God had often judged other nations because they were actually sacrificing their children to false gods. So why is it that God would offer or ask Abraham, command Abraham, to offer his one and only son. Well, we looked yesterday at some reasons that are really not given in Scripture, uh, but we can see them in the narrative of, of what's recorded in Genesis chapter 22 for us of the whole story. The first thing we saw that that uh, God had commanded Abraham to offer Isaac as a means of testing his faith, of, of proving his faith, not proving it to God, but to cause Abraham to draw near and seek God and more and oftentimes in our lives, tests come so that it, it proves, it refines our faith as we learn to lean and to trust on God. And we're reminded that, that it's impossible to please God apart from faith. Uh, it is pleasing to God when we're obedient to his commands. Jesus said, if you love me, you obey my commands. But that starts by faith. Where there's not a faith, then it's impossible to please God. And of course, we know as believers that it's our faith and our trust in God. There's nothing that makes us right with God apart from our trust and belief and faith in Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for us. The second thing was that we had stated that that Isaac uh, being sacrificed or figuratively being sacrificed by Abraham to God was to show that Abraham was the father of all 
who would be of the faith. And we know at this point now, we are the seed of Abraham. And so as Abraham was made righteous, Abraham was made right with God by his faith. We know that, um, that again, in order to be right with God is to trust in God, to trust in Christ's sacrifice in that. So Abraham was proven to be the father of all who would have faith in God, and that includes us. His command was to provide an, ab, uh, an example to you and I of absolute obedience, that God calls us to obedience. Um, uh, it's one thing to believe the truths of the Word of God, to agree with His commands, but it's quite another thing to walk out in those commands in obedience. And God does call us to obedience to His Word and His commands. Fourthly, we had said that the command of to sacrifice Isaac was to reveal God as Jehovah Jireh, um, that there was no lamb that Abraham took with he and Isaac up the mountain. <clears throat> and at one point, Isaac said, you know, I see the fire and I see the wood, but where's the lamb that we're going to sacrifice? And the first time the word Jehovah Jireh, God is our provider, is listed in that account. And so we look to God as our provider, first and foremost, as our provider for the payment of our sins. He made a provision for that in Christ. But in all of our life, we're to look to God as our provider and not to man and not to this world. Um, the world has a lot of things to offer. They glitter like gold and diamonds, but boy, they are not what brings soul satisfaction. And so God is our provider and every means that we have, God is our provider. And, you know, I've learned in my life, sometimes God will withhold in order for me to recognize him as my provider. And if you've ever been through seasons of that, you know, it's a difficult season. But when you go through that season, you realize that God has been your Jehovah Jireh, God, our provider. Now, lastly, we began yesterday when the power went out to recognize that God's command to sacrifice Isaac was to foreshadow God's sacrifice of his own son. And this account in Genesis chapter 22 that's recorded is a prefiguring of what we would see revealed in the New Testament of God sending his son, his one and only son, to be an atonement and sacrifice for our sins. An atonement, a payment for our sins where there was no other provision or way for our sins to be uh, eradicated, our sins to be erased, our sins to be taken away, and us removed from the punishment of our sins, that uh, God would send His Son, Jesus, as an atoning sacrifice. And there's some parallels that we see in this story in, Gen in Genesis chapter 22 of, uh, of Abraham offering up his son Isaac uh, to God, offering His one and only Son, Jesus, as a payment for our sins. If, you'll, if, you, if you have your Bibles, look in Genesis chapter 22, verse 20, verse 2. God commands Abraham. He says, Abraham, take your son, your one and only son, whom you love. And of course, the command was to take your one and only son, the son of the promise, the son by which you know I'm going to fulfill my covenant promise to you. Uh, take that one son and sacrifice. And you can't help but imagine Abraham may have thought, well, how is he going to fulfill the promise if I sacrifice his son? With well, a parallel we see in this is recorded in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, God the Father so loved the world, that he sent his only son. And we know the sending of his son was not just to send him at the incarnation uh, where he was born of a virgin, was, but was to send him so that he could be a sacrifice for our sins. Uh, we notice in here that God's command to Abraham was that, that he would take Isaac to, to the, the region of Moriah and sacrifice him there. The incredible thing about this spot, Moriah, um, it's pretty well established that that was the location where some thousands of years later, uh, the city of Jerusalem would be built. And our Lord Jesus, the Son of the Father, would be sacrificed perhaps in that very location where Abraham had taken his son Isaac, if not the very location, at least at minimum in that region. So it was a foreshadow, a prefiguring of where the ultimate sacrifice would be made, where Jesus would be crucified there on that hill called Golgotha as a payment for our sins. 
Then we look again in, in verse 6 of Genesis chapter 22. It says, So Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. Notice this. It was the wood where the offering would be laid and the offering would be burnt as a sacrifice to God. And so here we see a prefiguring. He didn't call Abraham to murder his son, but there was a sacrifice, an offering that he was testing Abraham in to see whether or not he was willing to do this. And we see in John chapter 19, verse 17, that just as, um, as Isaac had carried the wood for the offering, the sacrificial offering, Jesus himself walked to Calvary carrying his own cross. Again, a prefiguring there of what was to come. And then in verse uh, 7 of Genesis 22, but, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Isaac asked the father. Again, I see the wood and I see the fire, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? And we see in John chapter 1, verse 29, where John the Baptist said, Behold, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so the question was, where's the Lamb? And ever since the Exodus, where it was brought out more in the Passover, where the Lamb was sacrificed, the nation of Israel would look for a Lamb that would be a covering for their sins. And when Jesus came on the scene at the age of 30, and when John the Baptist recognized him, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The next thing we see is that um, Abraham acted in obedience. Genesis chapter 22, verse 9. He acted in obedience to his command. And we saw this a lot in the Gospel of John as we went through the Gospel of John, that Jesus... Um, Jesus' main concern was being obedient to the Father. We might say the motivation for Jesus' coming and being a sacrifice was that he was being obedient to the Father. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 39, it says that Jesus, as he was there at the Garden of Gethsemane before he would go to the cross, he prayed to the Father, said, Father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken away from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And so we see here that Jesus was obedient um, to the Father's will, just as you and I are called to be obedient to the will of the Father. Well, lastly, um, Isaac was resurrected prefiguratively. We see here in Hebrews chapter 11, where it stated, though, that in verse 19, uh, he considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. And of course, we know the narrative of the story of, of Isaac being sacrificed by Abraham, just as Abraham lifted up his hand to bring the knife down to slay his son. Um, God withheld his hand, and uh, his son was spared because there was another lamb provided in the thicket. And so we see prefiguratively that there was going to be a resurrection from the dead. And Abraham believed that even if he had sacrificed Isaac, that God was able to raise him from the dead. Um, somehow or another, Abraham had received that knowledge. And I think by God, he had given it to him that, uh, that there would be a resurrection. So Abraham again reasoned that if he had sacrificed him, and in 1 Corinthians 15, 4, it says, Jesus was buried and was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And so we see an incredible thing here, um, how incredible God is in his plan and his progressive revelation where he reveals to us throughout scripture his, his, his uh, plan and his method and his means of sacrifice of his son Jesus for the payment of our sins and the hope of the resurrection. Well, I pray today that you'd meditate on these truths and you'd recognize and realize how deep the Father's love is for you and for me and that he sent his one and only son, that he would be a payment and a sacrifice for our sins. And I trust today that if you're watching this, you have placed your trust in Christ. If you've not placed your trust in Christ and you wanna know more about how you can do that, I'd love to have an opportunity to talk to you. You can make a comment there in the comments and I would love to get back with you and get with you and share with you how you can truly know that you know that your sins are forgiven by the shed blood of Christ.
Pray today that God would give you an opportunity to plant a seed of the gospel in somebody's heart. And we would recognize that a seed has been planted there, that God would give us the wisdom, uh, the courage to know how to cultivate that seed. And if God, by his grace, would allow us to witness somebody be saved today, uh, where he saves them and, and we're a part of that, that would make our day. And so let's pray and ask God to give us those opportunities. Let's be intentional about that. Faith comes by hearing and that by the word of God. And so we want to be obedient and we want to be ready to share the gospel with those that we come in contact with today. Well, I look forward to seeing those that are part of First Conyers this morning in person in our corporate worship, uh, that you would be here to worship the Lord together. Our main purpose for gathering on Sunday mornings is to worship God. We worship Him through song. We worship Him through our giving of our tithes and our offerings. And we worship Him in response to the Word of God. And so make plans to be here this weekend in person. And if you're not in our area and you're watching, make sure you uh, make plans to connect in a local church and worship God this weekend. I pray the Lord blesses you. I'm looking forward to seeing you um, next Monday morning on our daily, daily devotion and share this devotional. Let's get the word out there so people can grow in the knowledge of the word of God. I love you and I pray you have a great day.